You're listening to the month of May devotional summary. Just one banana. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, New King James Version. I have always enjoyed reading the true stories of missionaries and learning how, through terrible trials and suffering, they have remained faithful to the Lord. One of these stories is documented in Darlene Debler's Rose biography. She told the Lord that she would go anywhere with Him no matter what the cost. In 1938, at the age of 21, she was the first American woman to enter the rugged interior of Dutch New Guinea with her pastor husband, Russell. The young couple, however, was captured during the Japanese invasion of World War II and sent to separate prison camps never to see each other again. Through the crack of her cell window, she witnessed a guard in the country yard sneak a bunch of bananas to a woman. At this point, only skin and bones, Darlene dropped to her cell floor exhausted and began to crave bananas. She looked up and pleaded to the Lord for just one. But how could God possibly get her a banana through these prison walls, especially with the fact that she was not allowed to have any visitors. Through an amazing series of events, her past comp commander had bananas delivered to her cell. Not just one banana, but 92. She credits these bananas with keeping her alive until her rescue at the end of the war. For 10 years, I was a single parent with four children to raise. I felt like darling, isolated in the dark prison cell with no one to help me. I cried out to the Lord daily for many times I didn't know where our next meal would come from or how He would provide for our basic needs. But provide He did. In one instance, a church friend took my children for the afternoon to play at a park. When she returned in the evening, she had fed them and brought them new school shoes. God can do miracles even in the most unlikely circumstances. He knows our situation and cares for us with an everlasting love. If you find yourself in a difficult situation, trust in Him with all your heart. We cannot lean on our own understanding, for His ways are not our ways. He will not fail us, even in the darkest of situations. Karen M. Phillips Share your thoughts about this devotions. God bless you. The Road to Emmaus For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 11 Have you found yourself on the wrong road going in the wrong direction? Do you feel that all hope is gone? Take courage from disciples who traveled to Emmaus with heavy hearts. Two disciples were not able to believe testimony from the women who had found an empty tomb and heard from angels that Jesus is alive. They turned their backs on the last place where they have been with Jesus and walked back to their former life in Emmaus. Luke records the road to Emmaus is about 7 miles from Jerusalem, but researchers do not know the exact location. Since the disciples seemed to have arrived home together to prepare a meal, scholars believe that a named disciple is the wife of Cleopas. She joins a long list of unnamed women mentioned in the Bible. Read Luke chapter 24 verse 13 to 25, 
to discover how the Savior gives the woman a future and a hope on that sorrowful morning when she cannot see Him. Jesus walks with you even if no one knows your name. The unrecognized Jesus moves close enough to overhear the distress of the couple. Filled with concern, He engages them without an introduction. He walks for miles, giving them His full attention. Even if you feel like a nobody, you are the most important person in the world to Jesus. He never ignores you and always accepts your invitation. He is available for the sinful woman to anoint his feet. He does not judge the woman caught in adultery. He eats with unnamed publicans and prostitutes. Jesus walks with you no matter where you are. You may be walking to nowhere, to a place that isn't on the map, but Jesus shows up for you. You may not recognize Him, but He is your companion the entire journey, no matter how far you go before detecting His presence. Jesus walks with you to remind you who you are. The two disciples think they have reached their dead-end destination, but then they recognize Jesus and notice their burning hearts. Suddenly aware that they are not fulfilling their purpose as his disciples, they return in a rush to Jerusalem, overjoyed to share their story of hope and to begin writing another chapter of life. If you are walking down the wrong road, invite Jesus to walk with you. He knows where you are. He will remind you who you are, where you are going, and why you need to get there told by Juan Cortez to Rebecca Turner. So, what do you think about this story? Comment down below and let's share your thoughts. Weakness is strength. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 I had been having a pretty rough days. Everyone and everything were annoying me. It was hard to pinpoint exactly why I was annoyed and getting irritated with my husband and my kids. Then I realized it was the same old problem creeping back. The voices which I thought were behind me again taunted. You're stupid, weak, you can't do it right. God can't use you because you aren't good enough. Your family doesn't really need you. I'm sure many of you reading this can relate to those voices. They can be very strong and overpowering at times and discourage us easily. Have you ever thought you are too messed up to be of any good to anyone? What helped me get through these times beside the support of a loving family are God's promises. If we listen to His voice, He will tell us the truth. One Sabbath, during this time when I was feeling down, we sang fittingly. A hymn whose words started going through my head. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. How true that is! I do need him every hour, minute and second of every day. The negative words in my head are not God's, but rather those of the great deceiver. He wants his words to make us give up. But God has different words. He tells us that He is strong when we are weak, and when we realize our weakness for the opportunity it is to let God perfect us and His grace to cover our imperfections, then we can have victory. We are strongest when we are weak and rest in God's strength. Paul said that the power of Christ is perfected in our weakness. 
I know that you and I will still have rough days sometimes, but we have the promise that despite our infirmities, we can rest in Christ's strength and know His grace is enough. So the next time you feel less than enough, weak, powerless, and defeated, remember that you have a Father who has given everything to make you strong. He will always be enough for you if you will believe in Him instead of in the enemy's lies. Deborah Snyder I would love to hear from you. Comment down below your thoughts about this devotion. What's in your heart? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalms chapter 51 verse 10 As I sat in the church on a recent Sabbath, the pastor was preaching about the prayer. He was making a point that God wants to know what's in our hearts. He doesn't see us as others see us, but God looks at our heart. If you cut open your heart, what will God see? Asked the pastor. Hmm, this got me thinking. I couldn't focus on the sermon anymore. I began to think about my heart and what was really in there. And what does God see? My life hasn't been a Disney movie. There has never been a happily ever after for me. I thought about my day at church and what was in my heart just that day. I know that in my heart I have pain, hurt, grief, loneliness, sadness, and remorse. And that was just from that day. So thanks to my smartphone, I began a search for the word heart in the Bible. Many scriptures came up. I needed to find out what I could do to have a heart that is acceptable to God. As I searched the scripture, I found several promises that God gave me peace, assuring me that I could be acceptable to God regardless of my heart condition. First, 1 John chapter 3 verse 20 reads, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Okay, so God knows my pain. Hallelujah. He knows my life experiences that have caused my heart to hurt. Then, in Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26, I found this promise. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony, painful, hurting, lonely, grieving, remorseful, sinful heart, and I will give you a heart of flesh. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5, I read, Trust in the Lord with all of thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. So instead of trusting myself and my feelings, I must trust God to work out my life for me. And last I discovered that I must delight myself also in the Lord and He shall give me the desires of my heart. My heart desires peace. My heart desires to be free from loneliness and pain. My stony heart wants to be replaced with a heart of flesh so I can be available for God to go where He leads me. Eva M. Starner So, what do you think about this story? Comment down below and share your thoughts. The Joy of Honest Living Pray for us. For we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 18 My husband and I spent many years as missionaries in a country where people were kind and generous. 
While my husband worked as a pastor, my job was teaching English to high school students. During those years, there were only three schools where English was the language of instruction. Our school had always had a long student waiting list, for we could accommodate only 500 students from 1st to 12th grades. Most of my students came from rich families whose chauffeurs drove them to school in Mercedes Benzes. One day, during the class discussions, we happened to talk about the challenges of driving in that very large city. At some point in the discussion I shared, I am in the process of preparing to take a road test. I want to be able to drive here, especially when my husband is away for a week or two. Teacher, just relax, said one of my students. Then he continued in a happy tone, I'll take care of it. I'll pay for your driving test fee. Just wait for a few days and you'll have your license. I thought I had not understood very well what my student had just said. Yet he confirmed, I will bring you your driver's license in a week. Well, I hastened to explain. I don't operate my life in ways that are dishonest. However, I do appreciate your kind offer, yet I cannot accept it. I thank him profusely before the discussion ended. Shortly after that episode in the class, my family and I decided to emigrate to Canada. It was in my new country that I was able to take my driving test. God was gracious enough to allow me to pass the test so that I could drive in my new country. Sometimes, we are faced with situations that seem to offer shortcuts out of or through our dilemmas. Yet, God cannot bless choices that cut corners on honesty. The writer of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 18 affirmed that he had a good conscience because he desired to live his life honorably. We can have that good conscience too when we live lives that honor God. Ophelia A. Pangan So, what do you think about this story? Comment down below and share your thoughts. A Legacy of Faith I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. 3 John chapter 1, verse 4 I have fond memories of Grandpa Francis, but I don't recall my very first distinct memory of him. Was that first memory the sight of him leading out in a Friday evening Vispers program? Or perhaps it was saddling his donkey to go to his farm? He was always busy doing something. I was raised surrounded by my father's side of the family. Mom and Dad separated when I was very young, yet somehow we three girls found ourselves surrounded by the Francis clan. As such, I received my spiritual nurturing from Grandpa Francis. I recall many family worship sessions that were held in his room. Then, there were the family choir practice sessions directed by, yes, you guess it, Grandpa Francis. I smiled as I remember those rehearsals. The songs had to be just perfect based on Grandpa's standards. As a child, I knew my grandfather was blind, yet in the midst of his darkness, he brought me to light of God's love. He modeled industry. Grandpa's lack of vision did not impede his ability to farm his land and provide for his family. He was a man of faith who was dedicated to serving his God. Another great legacy of faith that Grandpa left me was the value of being on time for church. No one, not even his precious wife, Lynn, could make him late for his divine appointment with God. 
decades after his demise, the values Grandpa Francis passed on still resonate in my heart and mind. In fact, I try to carry on as I live out Grandpa's legacy of faith in Jesus. I live in the anticipation, as he did, of Christ's return so I can be a part of the great reunion with loved ones. I am encouraged by the words of the first song I sang with my family choir. What? Never part again? No, never part again. And soon we shall with Jesus reign and never, never part again. I challenge you to live according to the legacy of faith in Jesus that you have received and to improve on it as, by God's grace, you endeavor to impart it to succeeding generations. Andrea K. Francis So, what do you think about this story? Comment down below and let's share your thoughts. Humble me, O Lord. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. As my husband Walter entered the room for the ordinance of foot washing that communion Sabbath, he saw another man sitting alone. It appeared as if no one was going to offer to wash his feet. Walter couldn't help but notice that the man appeared to have just wandered in off the street and was, perhaps, only a step away from being homeless. Walter wasn't excited about washing the man's feet either, but the Holy Spirit kept nudging him. This is what communion is all about. If you can't serve him, then you don't need to be here, said that still, small voice. So Walter walked over and introduced himself to the man. The man's filthy socks and strong body odor made him feel nauseated. I met the newcomer the next Wednesday evening at Bible study where we became his friends. Several times, Walter and I talked about inviting him home for dinner but just couldn't figure out how to go about doing so. After all, he really wanted to fit in with our other guests. Our church is very large, so we assumed that, on Sabbath, the newcomer was probably sitting on the other side of the church, in the balcony, or downstairs, out of sight, out of mind. Many months passed, and then, out of nowhere, the man entered church and sat right in front of us. As I listened to the sermon, the Holy Spirit spoke directly to me and must have spoken to Walter as well. He is on our mind, what do you think? Whispered my husband. I whispered back, invite him, but only if he is willing to take a shower when we get home. The man accepted our proposal. As his clothes washed, he showered, put on some of Walter's clothes, and came out sprinkled in cologne. We all gave him big hugs as he grinned from ear to ear. As we ate, he talked about his former home church many miles away where he regularly ate in the soup kitchen. That's how he first joined our denomination back in 1987. When I got up this morning, he said, I had no idea that I would be invited to your home for dinner. I can't believe this. Thank you. Tears surfaced in his eyes as I thought about the lesson we needed to learn and the blessing we almost missed. Lord, help us to humble ourselves so that each day we can be used by you. Surely saying for them. Share your thoughts about this devotions. God bless you. It's not all about you. And we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love Him. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. I was coming to terms with being left out, yet again, by family and things that happening the way I wanted them to. 
but surely God had blessed me, truly blessed me beyond my wildest dreams. So why I was so disillusioned? Yet I was. I was still feeling hard done by, and who is me, but why? Hadn't God been good to me and performed miracles before my very eyes? Yet God is patient with us and goes on loving and loving, which He did for me that night. In His infinite grace, He gave me the words with which I have entitled this devotion. He shared them in a soft, loving, and not harsh way. It's not all about you, and it isn't. I felt Him reveal this to me, and I began to see that situation troubling me really wasn't all about me. In those early hours of the morning, I penned these words which I felt came from Him. When an artist paints a picture or someone creates a tapestry, it is not single brushstrokes. It is a combination of many different brushstrokes and many strands of threads. So this situation is also part of something bigger and more beautiful. God was doing something amazing to bring about an end result, incorporating my loved ones and friends. I hadn't had things happen as I felt they should have. Even though I wasn't seeing it, not until then, this situation wasn't all about me. It never had been, nor ever would be. God wants to have my family in the picture too. How silly I had been. All these feelings of abandonment would pass. I had felt harshly treated about being left out. Yet, I wasn't being left out at all. Eventually, when I stood back, I realized that I was included and had a vital part to play, as does every thread in a tapestry and every brushstroke in a painting. All things were working together for good. It is true that God could use anyone, but He chose to use me and He chooses to use you to complete His works of art. So let's not be disheartened or hurt and upset if we are not always where we want to be and doing what we want to do. When we see the whole picture, we will shine, give glory to God, and be so pleased that we were part of something bigger than we had thought. Be blessed, knowing you are part of His amazing work no matter what life brings. Laura A. Canning I would love to hear from you. Comment down below your thoughts about this devotion. Jesus can fix anything. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your mind. For in the realm of the dead where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10. My grandpa Joseph Kopitar moved from Austria to Brazil after World War I when he was a teenager. Everyone who has been an immigrant knows how hard it is to start all over in a country with everything different from that in one's homeland. He had many adventures traveling on foot around Brazil. He worked as a baker, pizza chef, upholsterer, carpenter, builder, and farmer. He also learned about God and gave his heart to Jesus. He taught us by his faithful example how to do things well. He used to walk long distances to study the Bible with others. We could offer him a ride in our car, but he would respond, Thank you, but I rather prefer to walk. Having a father like Yusef Kopitar, my own father learned how to fix things starting from his earlier years. Even now, we always have a list of broken things waiting for my father to fix. He fixes them better than they were when they were new. He saws, sands, retouches, and glues until they are perfect. If he feels his work is not perfect, he starts all over again. 
he measures carefully, aligns the fruit trees in the garden, levels and centers pictures, and repairs toys so they are like new once more. This is the way my father does things. My older nephew Kaiki was still a little child when a friend broke one of his toys by accident. After inspecting the severity of the damage, my nephew told him, Don't worry, my grandpa is like Jesus. He can fix everything. Kaiki is now an adult, but we were taught a great lesson that day by the words of a faithful little child. Jesus really can fix everything. He can fix broken hearts, broken health, broken relationships, broken bank accounts, broken businesses, broken dreams, and even broken faith. Sometimes, life is not easy for us because we want to do things our way. But I am learning to surrender all to Jesus. He knows better than we do how to cut men send paper and recharge us so that we can become new in him would you like to surrender to jesus your broken toy today and watch patiently what the outcome will be whatever is broken in your life keep in mind that jesus can fix anything kenya kopitar so what are your thoughts about this devotions comment down below and share your thoughts Thank <laughs> you.